Right. Um, thank you very much, everyone, um, for the kind and warm welcome, especially for those of you who are um, getting up at inconvenient times <laughs> and or um, coming in from Australia. As Hillary said, my name is Patricia Dark. I'm the Borough Archivist for Southwark, and I've been working for Southwark Council for about nearly 13 years now, which is slightly um, disconcerting. And what the heck did that do? Right. Let's resume the slideshow. So um, the, the title of my talk is Southwark 8Z, Southwark Archives Map Collection. Um, and basically, the I, I thought I'd start with with an overview. Um, basically, what the, this talk will be dealing with is first some important things to note about our map collection. Um, second, some important background about maps of London, sort of what's in a London map. Um, then I will be looking at types of maps in our collection with some examples. Um, what you can learn from our maps fairly briefly. And finally, I thought I'd end with giving you a, a very quick gallop through some online mapping resources. Um, so to begin with, oh, here we go. Um, so there are some important, some important things to keep in mind before I start into the meat of this talk. Um, basically the limits of both this talk and our map collection. Um, for historic reasons, Southwark Archives map collection is mixed in with a wide variety of plans, including um, estate plans, so sort of maps of landed estates in the local area, but also um, literally plans of buildings, road and rail infrastructure. Um, generally speaking, I will not be discussing plans um, rather than maps. Similarly, most graphical depictions of London before the Great Fire of 1666 are actually panoramas. So they're bird's eye view drawings of the city, which focus specifically on showing the building cities. They're not really concerned with accurately depicting the geographic layout of the city in the, in the way that a map does. So this talk won't deal with panoramas any more than is absolutely necessary. Um, Another thing to note is that Southwark Archives mostly holds maps of Southwark. Um, like the rest of our collections, it, it, our map collection focuses on the modern borough of Southwark. So what that means, in other words, is that if you're interested in an area that lies on the borders of the modern borough, and that holds true um, for bits of Camberwell and Hearn Hill, mostly areas in what used to be the metropolitan borough of Camberwell, but there are areas on the um, northern, in the northern third of the borough that um, had their boundaries switched at some point, usually around 1900 or around 1965. Um, so, you may need to either visit another archive or go online to find the map that you need. Um, on the other hand, some maps of Southwark aren't held in our collections, but they're held by other archives. Um, the two most notable places that hold maps of Southwark are the London Metropolitan Archives and the National Archives. And again, this is for historic reasons. Um, some maps were created for and held by organizations whose records are cared for by other archives. So examples of that would be the local religious parishes and the poor law boards of guardians whose records are held by the London Metropolitan Archives or the Metropolitan Board of Works whose records are also held by the London Metropolitan Archives. Um, the other, the final point to keep in mind is that our map collection is not necessarily either comprehensive or original. Um, Southwark Archives doesn't hold every map ever made of Southwark um, because we, we don't necessarily have the capacity to do that. And the maps that we hold, many of them are copies, especially of early maps, they're copies published by the London Topographical Society. And Broadly speaking, our tithe maps are copies from either the National Archives or the London Metropolitan Archives. Um, yes, that's both. 
Excellent. So the other bit of background, what's in a London map? Um, and this might sound simplistic, but it's important to remember that maps of London show London. Um, and in particular, they show places that the map maker considered to be part of the London urban area and also important enough to enough people to show their geographical relationships to other parts of the built up area of London accurately in terms of things like distance and direction. Um, this is incredibly important to remember, especially for panoramas and the early maps. Um, panoramas in particular had the fundamental purpose of being public relations for London. Um, they meant to show the city as a major world power and very specifically as a rival to Paris. So what is considered built up and important changes over time. Um, for the Romans, the limits of the city of Londinium were the Thames, um, upstream as far as they could navigate and downstream to the limits of their bridge building. Um, roughly speaking, that means that Southwark is on the um, downstream end of what was considered the Roman city. Through the Middle Ages and early modern period, the city of London expanded east to the Tower and west down the Strand to meet the independent city of Westminster. Southwark was a separate area, again, one that only included the banks of the Thames in what we now call Bankside and the area immediately to the south of London Bridge, which my colleagues at council headquarters would probably consider the borough neighborhood. Um, so this is an area that had been um, an often disreputable suburb of London since Roman times. So whether these areas appeared in depictions of London varied. Um, most panoramas and the woodcut map of the 1560s show a handful of buildings on Bankside. Um, in contrast, one of the first detailed, accurate two-dimensional plans to scale of the city um, Ogilby and Morgan's 1676 map of London doesn't include Southwark at all. Um, Green and Morden's map made about 10 years later covers the area of St. George's Fields with artwork. By the end of the 17th century, a lot of map makers had codified their views as showing London, Westminster and Southwark, where again, Southwark meant the area around Bankside and London Bridge. Um, by the turn of the 19th century, London's built up area had expanded southward to include St. George's Fields and the Elephant and Castle, but a lot of areas of the modern borough weren't mapped as we would know it until the mid 19th century, at least not sort of published maps that were, were commercially available. At that time, a number of issues converged. And this is where um, maps are useful for reflecting changes. So first you have the development of transport infrastructure, roads, bridges, and especially the railways, which not only expanded what was considered what was considered to be London's built up area, but it also meant that people needed to understand how the different villages or former villages that made up London's built up area fitted together. Um, as lots and lots of areas, including an awful lot of Southern, particularly Southern, the Southern part, more Southern parts of the, the modern borough fell into the orbit of London suburbs. And secondly, the fundamental point of London's maps began to shift. Um, rather than showing off the capital to outsiders, maps increasingly serve to help administer the city. And we'll see some of those usages a bit later. So with all of that said, um, it's rather a lot of, of um, introduction, but I think it's quite important to understand our map collection. So one major type of map in our collection are early printed maps. Um, the earliest visual depictions of London in our collections are panoramas and maps created for the commercial market. And those were usually made by surveyors and engravers working as a team. Um, many of these early surveyors were European, although by the turn of the 19th century, government policy um, acted to drive them out of the market to ensure that hostile powers 
and here I'm basically talking about France, didn't have ac access to accurate cartographic data of the British capital. Um, early maps were often reissued um, regularly and even updated under their original creator's names even long after their death. Um, this is, as I mentioned, the earliest topical graphic topographical views of London or panoramas, and they tend to show the city of London on the north bank of the Thames from the south bank of the Thames. So for Southwark's purposes, they include the buildings and structures along Bankside that the, the designers considered important or noteworthy. Um, so these include the Church of St. Mary Overy, which was later Southwark Cathedral, um, which is just to the left of centre here, um, in this panorama, circa 1545, which was attributed to Anton van den Weingard. Um, and it also shows London Bridge, which is right in the center here, all built up, because this is still the, the medieval London Bridge. This panorama is also notable because it appears to have been sketched on site. So he would have been in Bankside taking a look at all the buildings before he put this together. Um, this panorama by Wenceslas Haller, published in 1647, is notable because it shows the view from a single point, the Tower of St. Mary Overy, or as we know it, Southern Cathedral. Haller completed the sketches he worked this panorama from between 1636 and 1642. Um, this map, uh, commonly attributed to Ralph Agas and otherwise known as the woodcut map, survives in three copies dating to si circa 1633. However, internal details make it clear that these were copies of an original made in the 1560s. Um, it doesn't include much of the modern borough, but it does include the bull and bear baiting rings in Bankside, London Bridge, and St. Mary Overy Church, just to the right of center. This is the Ogilby and Morgan map that I mentioned earlier. In contrast to the woodcut map, it doesn't show the south bank of the Thames at all. Um, this next map is the revised version of the map in the previous slide, which was issued by William Morgan in 1682. Um, this version expanded its coverage to show all of the built up areas around the city of London at the time, um, and in, it included areas in Southwark as far south as the Elephant and Castle, which is just before the, the star or possibly all seeing eye, and Bermondsey, which is down here, and as far east as Rotherhithe Village, which is sort of strung out along here. This was the most comprehensive map of London available until John Roke's um, 1746 map. And here is John Roke's 1746 map. Um, in 1712, a 30% tax on imported maps spurred on a new generation of British cartographers, as well as include, encouraging European cartographers to settle in England. Um, John Roque was a French-born estate surveyor who moved to England with his family in the 1730s. In 1737, he began preparing a survey of the entire built-up area surrounding the city of London. This work was published in 24 sections with, and shown here as an aggregate of all of those sections. Um, in October of 1746. It went through multiple editions, including one in 1761, which updated the buildings that it showed. Like Morgan's map, Roke's, which was the definitive map of London until the early 19th century, depicts roughly the northern third of the modern borough, including Borough, Bankside, The Elephant, and Rotherhithe and Bermondsey villages. Um, so this here is London Bridge, basically in the center of the map. And you can see Borough High Street. Um, I'm pretty sure actually that's Long Lane. That's almost certainly Old Kent Road. And then down here to the Elephant and Castle. And basically the Elephant is the last built up bit. Um, anything in terms of Walworth or Camberwell is covered up by this um, decorative cartouche, which is 
if I recall correctly, dedicating the map to the king. Roke also published, surveyed and published a map of 10 miles around London, which took in the areas of countryside that are now the southern two thirds of the borough, including Camberwell, Peckham and Dulwich. But I think it's very telling that that's a totally separate map entitled 10 miles around London. Those areas weren't considered part of the city proper at the time. Um, this, in 1790, um, cartographer Richard Horwood began fundraising for a new and ambitious mapping project. Like John Roke, he intended to map all of the built in, built up area in the environs of London, but Horwood wanted to go a step further and show every building in the built up areas of London with their street numbers. Um, his project was so ambitious that it took him nearly 10 years rather than his original projection of two to complete, and he never actually finished putting in the street numbers. Um, the, the final sheet of the first edition was published in 1799, and this is an aggregate um, image of that 1799 map. Horwood died in 1803. His colleague William Faden published three more updated editions of the map under his name. The last in 1819 was the most comprehensive map of London until the Ordnance Survey began its work in the 1840s. And this is um, a copy of um, one page of the 1819 edition of Horwood's map um, as taken from the A to Z of Regency London, which is in our open access collection. And it does give you an extremely good idea of which bits of the area around London Bridge were built up and which were open ground. So for instance, um, here's St. George the Martyr Church. Um, the library where I I'm currently sitting is basically that building right there. Um, Snowsfields is here. Basically, um, Guy's Hospital now occupies an awful lot of this space here. Um, and basically, Patricia, every, we yeah? can't actually see your pointer. Ah, that's try Control P and see if that. Excellent. So, ah, brilliant. I think. Oh. Here we go. Right. So there's, oh, shoot. Let me go back a second. Pointer. That is St. George the Martyr Church. Ugh. Okay. What are you doing? Right. Does that work? Ah, laser pointer. Here we go. So that's St. George the Martyr Church here. Um, this is the modern street of Snowsfields, and this is Bermondsey Street. So basically all of this area here is now either housing or uh, Guy's, church, uh, Guy's Hospital. Um, right. So, um, but notably the 1819 edition included infrastructure improvements like Southwark Bridge. So, right, the next type of map in our major, major type of map in our collection, which makes up a surprisingly large amount of our collection, actually, are maps created um, or in later examples modified by parish authorities. And very broadly speaking, these maps had two purposes, pageantry and administration. Um, maps allowed parish vestries, which were the first local authorities in England, to flaunt their wealth and power. So a lot of parish maps, especially early ones, were very highly decorative. Large framed maps hung up in a parish vestry hall um, gave residents a, a tangible source of civic pride, you know, something that they could point to. Um, and this was especially true in, in small urban parishes. Um, like, for instance, St. George the Martyr, um, which is the parish in which the library sits. Um, their maps often included engravings and plans of major local buildings, um, which allowed the vestry to create a kind of branding exercise that helped focus um, loyalty, civic loyalty in, in local residents. 
but maps were also useful for administration. Because they marked out boundaries, they could be used to leverage the situation in boundary conflicts with neighboring parishes, and obviously they could show local infrastructure like roads, rail, lighting, water, and later electricity or different kinds of housing. Um, so obviously this kind of, of geographic information not only gave a vestry information about what they what exactly they were responsible for in terms of say roads or lighting um, but also provided powerful graphic evidence of where the parish could most effectively spend its money to upgrade local infrastructure um, maps were also a necessary tool to enact legislation and um, one of the earliest extant maps of Southwark, which was probably created in the early 19 early 1540s was a town plan of, of the area that we now call the borough. And it was created um, as part, it, it was created to enact the legislation that outlawed the practice of sanctuary. Um, similarly, the early 19th century saw a wave of parish mapping. In part, this was because of the adoption of a single nationwide criteria for a cash replacement for the ancient parish tithe. Um, so what, became necessary was a survey of each parish, including a map showing every parcel of land in the parish and an assessment laying out its ownership and value at the time of the assessment um, to allow a fair comparison over the entire country um, for assessing the payments due instead of the tithe. So three copies of each parish tithe map were created. One went to the tithe commissioners and is now held at the National Archives. One went to the rector of the parish and one went to the parish vestry. Um, the latter two copies usually wound up in the diocesan record office. In Southwark's case, the diocesan record office is the London Metropolitan Archives. Mapping also followed the 1836 creation of poor law unions with surveying of every parish in the union being done by a single surveyor. Um, the 1832 Great Reform Act, which created the modern system of electoral boundaries and registers, also involved mapping to work out where the electoral boundaries were going to be. Mapping also gave vestries and their successors, the metropolitan boroughs, powerful tools for enforcement and action. Maps show the creation of parish and electoral wards and the branching off of daughter religious parishes as Southwark's population exploded during the 19th century. Our collection contains literally dozens of maps showing the changing boundaries of wards, uh, electoral wards and, and parish wards over time. Vestries also used maps. Um, by the late 19th century, they were often using ordnance survey or other commercially available maps rather than having surveyors create one um, from scratch to plot instances of disease, which could underscore areas where improvements to housing or infrastructure were needed. Um, decades later, during World War II, various metropolitan boroughs used mapping to coordinate their civil defense activities. So this is um, a map of St. Mary Newington Parish from 1832. It's our map uh, 403. It's not as ornate as some <laughs> maps um, in our collection or certainly in say the London Metropolitan Archives collection, but the very large and detailed engraving in the upper left-hand corner does suggest that this was kind of fundamentally a map for showing off. Um, but it also points out specific buildings. I'm pretty sure these are churches. Um, yeah, that would, that's St. Peter's Church. That's Trinity Church Square. So that's Trinity Church and that's St. Mary's Church. So it's, it's also pointing out the important buildings in the area, specifically the churches in a different color. This is the earliest detailed survey of Camberwell Parish by surveyor William Poole. Um, and I have to admit this map threw me off an awful lot when I first um, looked at this picture because it's oriented east-west um, rather than the, the more familiar north-south. So most maps of Camberwell, um, because this is St. George the Martyr Parish here, this is the northernmost, this is the northern boundary of Camberwell. 
and that's sort of crystal palace down here most maps would be rotated 90 degrees relative to this one it's it's entirely possible um that it was done this way to save on printing costs given that it's in color because you can put um the map in a much smaller space if you're orienting it um landscape instead of portrait um again you have this very ornate, very pretty color engraving. Um, so this again is possibly a map for showing off, um, but it's also very, very interesting to me um, because it demonstrates just how rural Camberwell Parish was at the start of the Victorian period. Um, right, so this is uh, Dewhurst's uh, map pair this is Dewhurst map of, of Camberwell based off of a survey done in eight, uh, 1842 this is based off the Tithe map and it's oriented the way we would expect it to be north south so here's um, Newington Parish and Bermondsey Parish down to Crystal Palace um, and it very clearly shows the growth of suburbia in the northern part of Camberwell Parish in less than a decade. Um, this would have been commercially available. We've actually got two copies of this map. I can't remember why I picked this one as opposed to the other one to scan. Um, Rotherhith Vestry commissioned the surveyors George Allen and George Porter to survey the parish in 1843. Um, they produced a truly gigantic volume with 36 sheets of maps. Um, some 20 years later, George Legg and John Davis Payne uh, completed a second survey, this time running to 34 sheets. These surveys are unparalleled in the unique level of detail that they provide of a fast changing, increasingly industrialized area. George Porter was the district surveyor for Rotherhithe Vestry, as well as Bermondsey Vestry, where he lived, and from 1824 for Newington District as well. Um, Porter surveyed Bermondsey Parish to a civil, similar level of detail between 1833 and 1836. This is a map done, I would assume, as, as sort of a smaller, less detailed um, accompaniment to the Allen and Porter survey, because the Allen and Porter survey is enormous. I can barely get it out of the store. And I, I am afraid I did not have the ability to take good enough pictures of it to put, put it in this um, talk. But what I find very interesting is that this map shows very clearly that people lived in a very small area of the parish of Rotherhithe and an awful lot of Rotherhithe was taken up by the docks. Um, so. By the later 19th century, um, a number of auxiliary bodies, burial boards, district boards of works, library and baths commissioners, for instance, had sprung up alongside the vestries um, to take up some of the enormous number of new administrative functions that they acquired during the Victorian era. This map um, from 1882, it's our map 250, um, shows land in Croydon that the burial board for St. Mary Newington Parish was looking to acquire um, as burials in the urban core became increasingly impractical. And in fact, by 1882, burials in the parish burial grounds in London was actually illegal. So this is, is much more of a plan, perhaps, than it is of a map, but it does have a scale. It does show you where buildings are, and it gives you an idea of where the land is. And in fact, you have a an inset map, and I'm quite certain that's a commercial map, showing you exactly where the particular plot of land they're looking at is in the sort of greater scheme of London and, and its environs. Um, this map I find absolutely fascinating. Um, Saint, and I, I should back up a bit. 
Um, St. George the Martyr was first mapped with St. Saviour's for the 18th century edition of Stowe's Survey of London. By the late 19th century, um, the vestry was leveraging commercial mapping. The, the underlying map here is the 1888 edition of Bacon's new large-scale ordnance atlas of London and suburbs, which they've basically acquired a copy of and then um, adjusted um, for public health purposes. So the colored areas on this map, which are numbered one, and this is our map 272, are numbered one, two, and three. And those are the three different wards of St. George the Martyr Parish. And then you have a number of different colored dots all over the map. I think it's purple, red, and black. And no, sorry, green, red, and purple. Um, and those refer to different colored, di different diseases. Red is scarlet fever, purple is diphtheria, um, black is smallpox, and green is enteric fever, which would have been um, some sort of gastroenteritis, basically. So what this allows them to do is work out, and all of those diseases are sort of feature overcrowding and poor general health makes you more susceptible to them. And so this is really useful in terms of public health because knowing that there's a very large um, cluster of uh, scarlet fever cases means that there's work that needs to be done in terms of sanitation and hygiene in that area. So the final major collection of maps or type of maps in our collection are those created by the UK's National, National Mapping Agency, the Ordnance Survey. To somewhat grossly oversimplify the history of the OS, its roots lie in a 1747 project to map the Highlands of Scotland it, in order to facilitate the location and arrest of the leaders of the 1745 Highland Rising. In the late, sorry, in the mid 1780s, the Royal Societies of London and Paris agreed to triangulate between the two cities in order to definitively locate their astronomical observatories relative to each other. The beginnings of the Napoleonic Wars ended this collaboration and the Board of Ordnance shifted to mapping the country with an eye to improving its coastal defenses. The Ordnance Survey's foundation in 1791 stemmed from a project to triangulate the UK and Ireland. In other words, to precisely locate some 300 major landmarks that could be used as fixed points for a local topographical survey and subsequently for mapping. This principal triangulation took until 1853 to complete. At first, OS was concerned with mapping the country at a relatively small scale, one inch to the mile, and this work was substantially complete by 1840. At this point, the Ordnance Survey's interests intersected with the project to value the country for tithe commutation. That prompted the development of maps at a scale of six inches to the mile. With the introduction of photozincography, which allowed images from photo photographic negatives to be transferred to zinc plates for printing, maps became faster, easier, and cheaper to produce. Surveying shifted to 25 inches to the mile from which the six inch maps were created. 25 inch maps give the acreage of the land par parcels they show, and until the 1880s had accompanying area books showing acreage and originally yet land use for each parcel of land. In London, the needs of land registration also coincided with the needs of sanitation. The cholera epidemic of 1848 made it clear that London desperately needed better sewers, and in order to build them, the commissioners of sewers needed to know the lay of London's land in order to use gravity to their advantage to remove human waste from London. That meant that they needed an accurate, detailed, leveled map. The skeleton 60-inch the mile maps that Ordnance Survey surveyed between 1748 and 1751 gave them that. Later revisions in the 1860s, 70s, 1890s, and 19 teens 
demonstrate the growth and change in London's streets and buildings during the late Victorian era. They also provided a basis for land registries index maps since land registration became compulsory in London in 1900. The London County Council also revised the third edition from the 19 teens, um, 60 inch ordnance survey maps in the early to mid 1930s. These are the last maps of London before World War II. After that, the ordnance survey began using metric measurements. So in terms of um, illustrating this portion of the talk, I wind up in something of a bind because um, the Ordnance Survey runs on Crown copyright, which means that I can't show you any maps that are less than 50 years old. <laughs> but this is um, a first edition Ordnance Survey map, um, Ordnance Survey reference 7, 785. Um, showing the Anchor Brewery. So this is basically the area around, well, basically this is the back end of Borough Market in modern parlance. Um, this is, the river is here. Um, so this is Bankside. This is a 25 inch map, it's second edition, so it would be the 18, about the 1890s. And it's London sheet 89. Um, basically, this is showing the bottom end of the Elephant and Castle roundabout, or at least what will become the Elephant and Castle roundabout. Um, that's St. Gabriel's Church. Basically, that's where the modern new uh, council gym is. You have Newington Butts and Walworth Road. So this gives you a really good idea of how built up by the end of the 19th century, um, built up an urban Walworth had become. Um, this is another 25 inch Ordnance Survey map. It's map 9.2 from 1916. And this is, gosh, where is this? Um, I think, oh, this is also um, Walworth. So that's St. Mary's Church, Walworth, Newington Crescent, Peacock Street. So this is sort of, again, the, the back bit of Walworth. And this is um, an LCC revision of the 60 inch ordnance survey map. This is map 787, and it's basically centered on the area between, um, basically it's centered on St. Xavier's Dock here. Um, and you can just about see down here, that is, so the, the original was done in 1919. That's the original ordnance survey copyright notice. And down in this corner, you can just about see, um, that says revised in, and I think it's 1935 or 1936. Um, and this is, like I said, the last map of London before the Second World War. Um, and to show you what use that could be, this is a World War II bomb damage map based on the Ordnance Survey 25 inch map 9.7. And this is Peckham. Um, and in fact, this here, this area here, I'm fairly certain is Peckham Library. And the color coding on this map indicates the amount of damage from enemy action that an area has seen from sort of yellow, which is basically the windows have been blown out to um, black and purple, which is this has been almost completely or completely destroyed. The circles on this map are all um, indicate, I believe, V1 rocket strikes. They're fairly big circles. It also indicates V2 rocket strikes um, using a smaller circle. Anything else is conventional bombing. Um, so basically, um, civil defense staff at the London County Council would have fairly continuously updated these maps based on reports from civil defense staff all over London. So what can you do with maps? I mean, they're pretty and they're interesting, but what can you do with them? 
And the, the most straightforward use of maps hasn't really changed over time. And, and that's providing a way for people to understand where they are and, and navigate in space. So collections of historic maps, particularly when paired with other reference material in archival collections, can be really useful for all kinds of historic research. Um, obviously, maps show the streets, buildings, and other amenities of an area at the time that they were created. So that allows family and building historians to translate addresses and street names into places in Southwark's landscape um, using maps and reference books like the post office directory. Um, so that ability to show life on the ground, as it were, is also really valuable for tracking changes. Um, another reference book, the London County Council list of street names, is extremely useful for tracing the changing names and numbers of London streets from the Victorian era to the, at least the mid-1960s, which is extremely useful for us in Southwark, given that the area saw wholesale street renaming as the postal system got increasingly bigger and more sophisticated. Um, so in other words, if you have a map that is approximately the time period that you are looking for someone in, even if you can't find the address on that map, coupled with the London County Council list of street names, you can work out what that street was named and therefore find that street on a contemporary map, even though you don't know the name. And with a street directory, you can then pinpoint where on the street, or at least come close to pinpointing where exactly on the street that building would have been. Um, and of course, while family and building historians find maps useful for their work, they're not the only people who find them useful. Um, maps show changes in the physical environment, the on the ground infrastructure of the city, which is really important for historians of architecture and urban planning. And for that matter, um, architects and urban planners working on modern um, projects. But those changes also reflect social, economic, and even demographic changes in the borough, which means they're useful to a wide range of researchers. Um, archaeologists can find our early maps useful for orienting themselves on a dig site, as well as providing useful context clues for the historic usage of the site they're surveying. Um, we actually had an archaeologist come into the search room um, trying to figure out whether the femur that some uh, workmen digging up Borough High Street had found was coming out of a burial ground or not, because if it was coming out of a burial ground, work would have to stop until all of those human remains were unearthed. And what she found from looking at early maps of the area is what they'd found was a waste pit for basically amputated limbs from Guy's Hospital. <laughs> Um, economic and social historians can trace the changes in the borough's industries and land usage with maps, and our staff can use those same maps in our educational engagement work. Um, the following slides will hopefully give you an example of what that looks like. Um, so this is literally a slide taken out of a presentation that I put together for Key Stage 2 students on the changing landscape of the riverside between London and Tower Bridges. Um, so it's a composite image from three of the LCC's um, revised 60-inch OS maps. Um, the upper right-hand corner doesn't, isn't in that image um, because it illustrates one of the sort of limits of our collection. Because the upper right-hand corner um, the, the map that would fit into the upper right-hand corner doesn't show Southwark at all. It's not in our collection. Um, so I colorized the maps um, to show children the major industries in that area between London and Tower Bridge 90 years ago. Red colored buildings are cargo transport infrastructure like wharves and warehouses. Blue are buildings associated with food and drink manufacture, and brown buildings are associated with the leather industry. 
Um, very few of these buildings are still used for those purposes, if they even exist, which makes this a really powerful tool for demonstrating to children the changing landscape that they've inherited and why their neighborhood looks the way it does and why, you know, why their world works the way it does. Um, these maps show the Walworth neighborhood um, at varying degrees of detail from the Ordnance Survey's first edition in 1874 um, on the top left to the first post-war maps in 1954 on the top right. And we scanned them for a display on the history of Walworth. Um, they're a really good example of how maps show not just changes in landscape, but also continuity. Um, because once you get, you know, the, the roads and the railways are still there and allow you to trace both buildings and infrastructure through time and give you a way to orientate yourself within time and the landscape. So I hope that I've given you a taste of the variety and breadth of Southwark Archives maps collection and the uses to which you can put it. But as I said at the beginning of this talk, lots of other places hold useful collections of map, maps and geospatial data, and an in, and increasing number of these collections are online. I'd like to introduce you to a few of them in the next few slides, and hopefully this works. So the first is the National Library of Scotland, which has a really enormous collection of Ordnance Survey maps available online, um, searchable both via the map reference or via a town name. Uh, no, that doesn't work. So what I will do, come on. Ah, what I will do once I've finished showing you these slides is go in and show you the actual websites themselves. Um, so this, this is actually, I have to admit, a composite of two screenshots. Um, one is the, the, the top is what you see when you click on to maps.nls.uk. Um, and it, you can browse all of the Ordnance Survey maps for a, a specific place, or you can jump down, um, which is the second screenshot, because they start with Scotland, obviously, and there are lots of maps of Scotland. Um, but they also have a map series of England, Wales, and Great Britain. And this allows you to choose um, what, basically what scale you want to look at. The London School of Economics holds the maps and notebooks associated with Charles Booth's pioneering inquiry into the life and labor of the people of London, more commonly known as the Booth Poverty Survey. Um, Charles Booth and his assistants, who were often associated with Toynbee Hall, completed it between 1886 and 1903, as well as inter interviewing workers, trade union representatives, business owners, ministers, and religious congregation members. Survey workers walked around London with local police beat officers, visiting houses, houses and talking to residents about housing, hygiene, and work. Um, they then compiled their findings into this map, um, which is color coded based on the socioeconomic status of the people living in that area from red, which is well to do, um, to black, which is um, extremely poor. In 2016, the inquiry's records were inscribed on the UNESCO UK Memory of the World Register, um, which is an honor that one of our collections at Southwark Archives shares. And the maps and notebooks were digitized as a result, which makes them available to anyone, anywhere, whenever they want. Um, this is Bombsite. Um, it's a project completed by the National Archives, and it provides a visualization of the London World War II bomb census maps and data that the National Archives holds. And the London bomb census documents literally individual bombing incidents of the Blitz between the 7th of October 1940 and the 6th of June 1941. It also provides the contemporary context for these locations via a modern map, as well as links to memoirs and other contemporary witness material that's available online. So things like um, 
uh, reminiscences from the BBC's People's War website or oral histories from the BBC or other providers. And finally, there's Layers of London, which is an interactive mapping site produced by the Institute of Historical Research. Like the Charles Booth's London site, it provides the ability to fade in and out of a modern map layer, making it easy to see how the borough's landscape has changed over time. And like site, it also features non-map data. However, unlike both of those sites, it allows users to upload their own data, um, photos, textual reminiscences, video, and audio. It also features maps from multiple locations across London and across time and allows you to choose individual layers to add to your map so that you can do you can do a wide variety of, of stuff with it. It's slightly overwhelming, in fact. Um, so if you're interested um, in learning a bit more, um, there are three books in our collection that I found really useful for this. Uh, Printed Maps of London, circa 1553 to 1880. Um, London Parish Maps to 1900, which came out last year and Ordnance Survey Maps, a concise guide for historians. And that is the end of the slideshow. But what I would like to do, I think, is show you some of the websites that I talked about. Um, Right. Let's go with this on and Right, so go back into Zoom. Ratchet. Ratchet computer, why are you being slow? Right. Much better. So Right, so this is bomb site. And as you can see, it's you can zoom in and out. And when you zoom out, it gets a bit overwhelming. But for instance, this little bomb icon means that there is only a single event in the bomb census. So when you click on it, it tells you where it is in the modern day and has links to historic images and memories from sort of contemporary memories from people's, from local people, um, which is really interesting. So this is the National Library of Scotland's website. So this is their map finder, which frankly, I find a bit overwhelming. Basically this grid is showing you all of the maps that NLS has holds and has scanned for that area. Um, you can also just go into here and browse. Um, so here, for instance, are the six inch maps, um, town plans of England and Wales. And you can actually check by town as well. So London has a whole bunch of maps at 1 to 15.60, this is five feet to the mile. 
and then you can just click on them. So for instance, 775, which is going to be up on Bankside somewhere. And there it is. So, and then you can zoom in and out more or less at will and then click into other maps of the area. Uh, right. Let me see. Yes, I can move this. And this is Layers of London, which might take a while to load. Oh, that's fantastic. <sighs> right. Okay, and I can't show you layers of London um, because, yeah. If you click on where, where you were previously and just go back to advanced and click on it, click on advanced on the screen. Mm, yeah, it's and go back down and get the other thing coming up. This is and really... click on proceed to booth. Yeah, this is that should that should load it if you click on it that link. It should, but it's not. So I suspect this but is did something. Did you click on it? Yep. Ah, there we go. So this is. William Booth's map of London. Um, and you can sort of fade into and out of a modern map of London and then click on these numbers and it shows you the entries to the Booth notebooks as well. So let's let's try. Let's try Layers of London again, although I think Layers of London. And you can, in fact, search these maps for modern addresses as well. Okay. Come on, fellas. Right. Advanced. There we go. Okay. This. I have to admit, I find Layers of London slightly overwhelming because at this point they've whacked an enormous amount of um, information onto it. So for instance, if I want to, I'm interested in Borough High Street, I can just type Borough High Street in and what I will get is collections and records and pins and, and all of these records are sort of stuff that other people have loaded on and needless to say, an awful lot of it doesn't have much to do with um, Borough High Street. So you can also check overlays and these are map layers. So for instance, there's the Ogilvy and Morgan map, there's Williams Morgan's 1892 map of Southwark and on and on and on. Um, you can pick up overlays that have listed buildings, geology, um, OS maps. So, and some of these will have been scanned to so say Charles Booth's poverty maps. And then you can turn these all the way up. And these sliders, again, are removing material from, whoops. Yeah. 
removing material from the the map it's it's useful but you do have to sort of put some work in to figure out how it works and i haven't necessarily had time to put that work in um since they did their last round of optimizing um so hopefully that was both useful and interesting and i think i'm going to stop sharing at this point